When was the last time you discovered a place that is truly great? The kind of place that no matter where you go, you breathe in its grandeur. You feel its history. You hear its stories. And you can't help but immerse yourself in its absolute, undeniable, well, greatness. Here in Cairns and Great Barrier Reef, you not only find all this, you might even find yourself. You truly feel changed by this place. It's in all your senses, the tastes, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and just the overall feeling like nowhere else on earth. It's somewhere that will stay with you for life. Because here in Cairns and Great Barrier Reef, you'll see great and leave greater. Oh, wow. Reminds you of what we've all been <laughs> missing during the pandemic, doesn't it? Hello, everyone. I'm David Kosh, and welcome to this webinar, The Great Purpose of Travel, thanks to Tourism Tropical North Queensland. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Well, we have a great session ahead of us at a time when a huge part of the country is emerging from lockdowns and borders are reopening. How good was it to hear from Alan Joyce and the Prime Minister this morning that Qantas is bringing back more flights to more destinations a lot earlier than planned. The, the pandemic has certainly made everyone take stock over the last 18 months, hasn't it? Both the industry and consumers. And you can sort of sense how consumers are now a lot more focused on connecting with each other and also the environment. And Australia and tropical North Queensland is incredibly well positioned to take advantage of this connection with the environment. As a destination, tropical North Queensland has long been leading the charge when it comes to best practice, nature-based and ecotourism in Australia. Uh, Douglas Shire, which is Port Douglas, Daintree and, and Cape Trib, of course, is the only eco-destination in Australia. More than 70% of visitors travel to the Great Barrier Reef with eco-certified high standard operators. So as borders reopen and we travel again, we have an opportunity to refresh our insights into making travel more purposeful again. So how has the global pandemic impacted on the environment? And what does the great travel purpose or purpose of travel really mean now and into the future? What is regenerative travel and how can sustainable travel be beneficial for tourism and the planet. Today I'm joined by a virtual galaxy of travel industry, industry gurus to advise us on this. Uh, first up, Mike Olson, the Chief Executive of Tourism Tropical North Queensland is with us. John O'Sullivan from Experience Co. Journalist and travel writer Lee Tullock. Uh, Johnny Murison from Jaramali Rock Tours and Quentin Long, the co-founder of Australian Traveller. Now, I'm gonna kick off with some questions to each of our panelists, but this session is all about you picking the brains of the panel. Many of you have already sent through questions. We've got a lot of them already, but the chat room is open for a lot more. So send them through and I'll leave plenty of time towards the end to get through as many as we can. But uh, let's get stuck into it. And, and Lee Tullock, uh, welcome to you. Um, look, first question, uh, just clear up the difference between sustainable travel and ecotourism. Okay, so sustainable travel really is doing no harm. It basically means that when we go somewhere, we put back what we take out. Um, so regener regenerative is slightly upping the ante a little bit, which is when we go somewhere, when we travel, we're actually going to add something uh, rather than, than take something out. And I think that the problem has been that we have taken so much um, in terms of over-tourism, you know, the biodiversity disappearing, that we actually have to now think about what we can do to make travel a power for good by actually 
um, putting something back. So that's that's kind of what regenerative is, as opposed to um, yeah. to sustain, just just merely sustaining. And and Lee, are you are you seeing a trend amongst consumers for this as well that 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 that's a, a value set that they're bringing into their decision making? Look, absolutely. I think it was happening before um, COVID. I think uh, there's been quite a bit of. Uh, I was looking back on some research, and and the, the questions were being asked of travellers. Then, I mean, people could see what over tourism was doing. So there was a there was a feeling, and then we had the pandemic, which of course was a big reset. People became suddenly discovered local things, supporting local communities, which is all part of regenerative travel. They valued nature, getting together with their families. This is this is what we're hearing. But I think um, the most important thing and why change is, is now coming is because of COP26 in Glasgow, because the fir yeah. for the first time, I can see the mainstream media taking this very, very seriously, even if some governments are still, you know, messing around <laughs> um, and undecided. So I think yep. that this is very much in, in the forefront of everyone's minds now. Uh, there's been a lot of, there are a lot of fantastic people that you can, you, you hear that pop up on the news or who are being interviewed. There's a lot of great stories. So I think that, that, that I would have said to be a little bit cynical that maybe people's intentions were very good, but they didn't have a kind of galvanizing moment. But I think we've got one now. Yeah, and I think this is where we can really launch launch off. So this is not a fad; it's a permanent no. cha change. You think, and and the pandemic has sort of reinforced this, has it? With with David At Attenborough series, beautiful one I saw the other day mm -hmm. on on Apple Plus, sort of the year that changed the world when we stopped travelling. Just the impact it had on nature was extraordinary. Yes, that's true. But I, I don't think it can be a fad because I think as travellers, we're going to be confronting this all the time now. I mean, the weather, the, 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 the sort of strange weather, things that are going to be happening that will be disruptive of travel. I mean, no one can go into Morrison's cave and, and, um, and hide from this. So, so travellers are going to be confronted with it. The tourism industry is going to be confronted with it. So we're, we're going to be reminded every time we you know, have a delayed flight or if we're in the air, I mean, I'm a nervous flyer. So all the more thunderstorms we're going to get are going to be problematic. Um, yeah. So so it, it's going to be something that I think everyone feels that that they can be part of it and, and, and wants to have some kind of control over it as well. Yeah, so how will this shape more meaningful travel into the future? What's your view on that? I think that one of the things that since I've been sort of investigating all this this year that, that was really encouraging was how much is already being done in the tourism industry. It's actually a very responsible industry and there's some, particularly in Australia, there's some, well, everyone on a, on a kind of global level is worried about climate change and of course we're very affected by it. So the small things that travellers do are not going to change the whole picture. But I think that there's so much already out there in terms of choices that we can make, very good choices of companies that are doing really interesting things and are thinking and are trying very hard. And so I think what's going to happen is people are going to realise that they do have choices and they will be able to... Um, to not, you know, to, to be able to, even if they, they choose to do a package holiday and go to a resort and which they're perfectly entitled to, it's blissful, but maybe think about something else that they could do. Think about the resort that they go to. Start asking questions of where they're choosing to travel and, and what they're doing. Look at certifications and all those kind of things. But even if you want to just lie and have a fabulous swimming pool, sort of think about, well, what can I actually contribute to that community in that place? Yeah. You know, is there a tour I can do with the First Nations um, group of people who, who will enlighten me more and I can give some of my tourist dollars to them. So I think the choices will be will be more yeah. evident for people and they'll be wanting to to make those choices. And 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 that that's a big indication for, for tourist operators that that's what consumers are looking for. So be prepared for it. Uh, people talk about greenwashing. 
as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a that's a great marketing ploy that we're seeing everywhere, where where companies are. Uh, use deceptive me measures to convince co consumers that they have green credentials. Now, you know, it, it's 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 in every industry. You know, it's it's in the fashion industry where someone says their clothes are organic, but they're actually, you know, using masses amount of packaging and water and those kind of things. Right. So everyone's responsible for this, and I think um, it's something that the consumer really needs to be aware of. There are, there are definitely ways to um, mitigate against this by looking to see if where you're staying with certification with B Corp or with um, Ecotourism Australia. There's a lot of there's a lot of information out there. If you stay somewhere and you find that they're still using single-use plastics, which really we should have got rid of yeah. long before this, go and ask questions and just, just try and make your voice heard because I think consumers have a very, very strong voice in this and they will be listened to. Yep, and you're going to be quizzed by it if you're an operator. Uh, let's bring in John O'Sullivan here. John, um, of course, Experience Co, uh, ASX uh, listed company. Um, how do you see the idea of travel with a purpose influencing the choices of your customer base? Thanks, Kochi, and um, like you, I'm also coming to you uh, here from Gadigal country, uh, and also I add my acknowledgements to Elders past, present and emerging. I guess for us, um, you know, people have always wanted to travel for difference. This has been a concept that's been around pre-COVID. It's it's not something new, and, and people look for when they travel, they look for two things, authenticity uh, and enrichment. And I think as we come out of COVID, um, one of the key drivers that people are looking for is that they're looking for this meaning and and, and purpose. So we see uh, we see you know travel for a purpose through you know the lenses of giving back and also transformational experiences. And really, what's quite interesting is that Tourism Australia uh, has just done some research on this, and what they're finding is increasingly now that. Uh, just over 60% of Australians now want to travel for giving back or purposeful reasons within their own country, which is a real step change from, you know, certainly uh, when I was at the organisation, uh, you know, several years ago. And in, in our international markets and out of region uh, travel markets, in the Western markets, it's around the same, or, you know, over 60% of travellers from those markets want to do the same and about 80, above 80% 80 in Eastern markets. So in those key inbound markets that, you know, we were talking about before that Alan Joyce announced today, it's a really, really important factor. And then same for transformational experiences, you know, about 70% of Australians are looking for transformational experiences and similar ratios, as I said before, about giving back for uh, consumers in those Eastern markets and Western markets internationally are looking for that as well. So what it's saying is very bluntly for, for an operator is purposeful travel is, is here to stay. And it's a really big driver of choice of company experience and ultimately destinations by customers. Yeah, because I, I was actually thinking about you as chief executive of a listed company. We interview you a lot on my Ausbiz um, business channel, TV channel. And so there's a, a big shift in the investment markets as well, isn't there, to, to ESG yeah. and sustainability. Yeah. So yeah. you're not only balancing it and, and focusing on your customers' change in value set, but also your shareholders' change in value set and your investors as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, it comes down to this notion of, you know, business for good is good for business. And that sounds a bit motherhood. But at the end of the day, the way we've we've assessed this is it, it really is a virtuous circle. So, you know, at the core of our business, we are a company that likes to provide these transformational experiences, but we also want to have um, experiences within our business that give back. And Dreamtime Dive and Snorkel is a great example of that in North Queensland, where we've partnered with four traditional owner groups. We've employed Indigenous rangers, but when you go out onto the reef, you get an individual story from the traditional owner perspective, which is very unique on the Great Barrier Reef as a, as a mm -hmm. sea country uh, experience. Um, so that's really important for us as a company. And then from our investor base, our investors are looking for, as you, you so rightly know, they're looking for a return on their investment. But increasingly now, they're wanting to know 
how are you getting there? You know, what is it behind your company? And this concept of ESG has become, you know, even in the two years I've been here, has become so much more apparent um, during my journey here at Experience Co as being a real driver for our investor base and a lot of the funds that have invested in us. And then ultimately the customer, um, you know, really, as we've talking about here, uh, really wants that. And, and also your staff. And really for us, you know, if we're going to give a great customer experience, it comes back to our workforce being engaged. And in many respects, you're being, you're having to justify these sort of, these sort of notions, but there's this concept, both your workforce and also your customer base. So it, it really is a virtuous circle that feeds yeah. into, into one another. And sort of this, uh, this consumer and investor trend to ESG, environmental sustainability, is really flowing through to businesses and setting your values, isn't it? It's not just about the products you provide, it's, it's influencing your values and philosophy overall yeah. within, your core, within your business. Yeah, and it goes to it goes to your purpose and your value sets. So for us at Experience Co, you know, our, our purpose is about helping you escape the ordinary, and that gets back into this notion of, you know, transformational tra experiences and also purposeful travel. Um, we have four, you know, really key values around the obvious ones, obviously safety and and adventure, but then we also have experience and and respect. And experience goes to providing those experiences that either give back to communities or, or give back to our customers. And respect is about not only respecting one another within our workforce and our workplaces, but also the environment in which we operate. So, you know, for us, it is, you know, very much at the, the heart of, of what we do. And we think ultimately, uh, you know, we think it, it becomes a competitive advantage for us in, in the category of providing experiences to, to approach it that way. And, and there are a lot of other businesses, as Lee said before, in, within the tourism sector that, that have embraced this. If you look at companies like Intrepid Travel, for example, they're great leaders in this, in this space. Yep. And, you know, and, and there are other companies that are doing it as well. But it, I think it's certainly competitively now really, really important to have that sort of value set within your business. Yep, absolutely, from top to bottom. Uh, Mark Olson, you're uh, Chief Executive of Tourism Tropical North Queensland. You look after a huge, huge part of Australia, don't you? Promoting it uh, the size of Victoria. Um, how has the pandemic affected the, the tourism industry in, in tropical North Queensland? And, and uh, what's your focus on rebuilding? Yeah, thanks, Koshi. It's, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining you from the lands of the Gimoi, Wadabara, Yudinji and the Yiraganji people. And, and their thousands of generations of connection to country inspire our thousands of tour guides um, who have had a, a really up and down period through the pandemic. You mentioned the size of the place and it's probably worth reflecting on. You're talking a landmass bigger than Victoria and a sea country bigger than uh, the country of Italy. So. As, an, as a community, um, we actually really rely very heavily on our visitors to help us with our conservation. And we've done that for generations. Uh, compared to Sydney, um, we have about 700 times as much land to look after per person. We've got about one and a half square kilometres of, uh, of land to look after for every person here in our community. So tourism has been a huge contributor to reef research, to the, the maintenance of uh, our rainforests, our um, looking after this beautiful place that we're in. And now we're seeing businesses like Johnny's um, playing a really important role in protection of country, uh, the archaeology and anthropology of thousands of generations of rock art. So what we've seen through the pandemic is a complete change in the Australian customer who's asking not just where are we going and when will we get there, but they're starting to ask why are we going and what's the story of this place and what does my travel mean to that place. So Cape York was uh, a very popular destination this year. And for the first time, we've seen more Aussie families really connecting with the story uh, of Australia and, uh, and of its first people. Um, right across the region, we've seen travellers who have flown over Cairns and the Great Barrier Reef many, many years, uh, having an international holiday in their own country. And they're asking questions like, how does tourism contribute to the environment? And it's programs like the Great Reef Census and Eye on the Reef. That means that our tourism industry is actually the front line of conservation of some of our most important assets. So this beautiful reef, beautiful rainforest and the world's oldest living culture actually supported 
in, uh, intricately by the tourism industry here. So it's been great to see the numbers. Obviously, very, very difficult with that international visitors and, and really difficult with the border closures. So many businesses are finding it difficult to play that really important role in conservation. Yeah, Mark, how do you, how do you explain to people when it's sort of a bit counterintuitive, isn't it, to say, hey, this is a really popular tourist destination, but it's enhancing the environment rather than taking away for it because you, you sort of naturally think more people, worse it's going to be. Um, how, how do you explain that uh, popularity in tourism can be good for the environment? Yeah, look, it's a question we've been asked a lot. As you said, um, through COVID, people have been seeing images of environments um, being restored without um, the population overflowing them. But I suppose many people have got to remember that particularly places like the Great Barrier Reef are some of the most protected ecosystems on earth. We've had stringent caps on the number of people since the 1980s, well below what you see in other popular places. You know, destinations like the Galapagos um, are relatively small and they carry quite a, a huge number of people who are really interested in the environment. We're talking about a, a sea country the size of Italy with very small numbers of visitors dispersed across those large areas. And it's actually the tourism industry who outnumber the, uh, the reef researchers almost four to one um, in getting out and keeping an eye on those environments. Um, we're now into uh, sea country restoration. John talked about the combination between indigenous culture and traditional ecological knowledge um, and action on the ground. Uh, we've been planting trees and uh, removing weeds from the rainforest for, uh, for decades. And as I said before, we're now starting to work really closely with businesses like Johnny to look after our rock art. So tourism is an integral part. And without visitation, we've actually found it harder and harder to get out there and see it, love it and protect it. And, and those are really important words for us. We believe that tourism is an integral part of getting people out to see these environments, falling in love with them and playing an active role in their protection. So we can't wait to have international travellers back because they're going to be helping us right there at the front line in regenerative tourism, uh, in active conservation and, and in keeping an eye uh, on these beautiful environments yeah. so that we can make sure that we're doing everything we can to look after them. Um, Mark, travelling for a purpose is, is a powerful way to, to reconnect uh, with both domestic and international tourists. Um, do you need to build things around it to make it more, more powerful as well? What are the other elements that, that need to bolt on to that? Yeah, we're, we're really blessed here, Koshi. We've got um, one of the highest proportional populations of PhDs, doctors in their field, working in the front line to help people understand what they're looking at. You might walk into a rainforest and see a sea of green, um, but when you understand the place that you're in, particularly if you're there with someone who's been to that site thousands of times, or you're lucky enough to be there with someone whose family have been there for thousands of generations, you get to understand that place in a really different way. And we believe that those transformational moments are the first step. Um, and then every business should be looking at the social and conservation efforts that they can be making to restore and, uh, and retain the quality of the environment and the, the deep living culture that we have in the world's oldest culture uh, here on earth. So tourism's always been a huge supporter and a driver of conservation and restoration. What we need to do now in the decade ahead is really demonstrate to our visitors how they can personally uh, contribute to that, whether it's uh, hands-on or whether they're making a contribution to the partners who are looking after these places. Because without tourism, um, the relatively small population of tropical North Queensland will find it hard to look after these global assets. So tourism is a key part in looking after the places for generations to come. Yeah. Well, let's bring in Johnny from up near uh, Cooktown, Cooktown in tropical North Queensland, of course, owner of Jaramali Rock Art Tours. Um, Johnny, tell, tell us about the country and, and what it's like to experience, to a first timer experiencing a trip up there. Hello, Johnny, you're just on mute. Just unmute yourself. And there we go, by the sound of it. Johnny, you're with us? I'm with you now. There you go. Excellent. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Um, tell us about the country uh, and yes. what it's like to experience it for the first time for a visitor. Yeah, um, 
Koshi, uh, my country is um, ecologically diverse. And, um, you know, you can start at the reef and rainforest and end up in the savannah grasslands and open woodlands. And, um, you know, it's rugged, it's beautiful, and all at the same time, you know. Um, spectacular sandstone escarpment country, waterholes, waterfalls. And, um, yeah, of course, all those uh, sandstone escarpment country is um, home to um, thousands of rock art sites. And so usually when um, after people go on four-wheel driving and, you know, one of the most extreme four-wheel drive tracks up to uh, the Jaramali camp, you know, the first reaction when they've arrived uh, to get up there is, um, wow. That's, that's yeah, usually yeah. always the first reaction. And, uh, you know, because our camp is situated right up on top of a sandstone escarpment and it, it is in the middle of nowhere. And uh, wh whether you get there by hardcore four-wheel driving or you've flown in um, over spectacular country through uh, with a... Um, a um, helicopter. Um, every time they arrive, it's 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 always wow. Yeah, it must be amazing for you to experience that from a customer coming to visit your land and just be blown away by it. What's the does it, does it give you a great sense sense of joy? What are what are some of the moments that that transform them that that you've seen in people? Yeah, so, um, you know, like the, there's a lot of transformational moments in people and and I try to explain to people, you know, it's like there's a lot of full driving, there's bush taka, there's bush medicine, there's rock art, there's spectacular scenery, sunrise, sunsets. And as, as I sat down uh, by around the campfire with uh, an elderly couple and I was trying to explain to them, I was like saying, hey, look, it's holistic, you know, and uh, but they said, yes, Johnny, it's all those things, but it's also very simplistic. And please don't change it. Leave it just the way it is. And uh, so um, everyone's moment is different, whether they're listening to the didgeridoo or um, sitting around the campfire or yarning around the campfire, having that campfire dinner, or it's the rock art. Everyone's moment is different. Um, or it can be the holistic, complete package where they've just walked away and it's just, wow. And that's one of the things that's uh, unique to us is that it's um, a lot of things combined in a overnight tour or a two night, three day tour. So, um, so I've, I've had many, many moments where with people that have really um, transformed them and, um, and I guess that they're just spending time with traditional owners and um, they, they see in country through our eyes, how we, how we see it and uh, how we experience it and how we lived off it uh, for thousands of years and, um, and how we thrived and survived. And, you know, one, one of the things that I get all the time is that they say that this experience will stay with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. So those, those moments um, for us, um, yeah, we feel very honoured. We feel very privileged. But also yeah. in regards to looking after and protecting the country, uh, it is a great responsibility yeah. to us as well. Yeah, it's quite spiritual, isn't it? Some of those experiences, and as you say, affects people in very different ways. Um, this is the year of Indigenous tourism. Um, the next, the new generation of Indigenous tour operators, and business people, entrepreneurs. Um, what are they? What do they look like? Are they? Are they? Are they embracing the challenge? Are they get? getting the support they need? Oh, for, you know, first of all, like, all, all, all my colleagues and <clears throat> fellow operators and, and, and Indigenous businessmen and women around this country, um, I'm just proud of them all. Um, they are all a force to be reckoned with. And they, a lot of their mums and dads and grandparents have all been taken off country. And, um, and so there's been lots of opportunities and ideas in their minds to return back home and to utilize their country in an economically fruitful way, like our country always provided for our people for thousands of years. And so they're bringing their Western knowledge. And when I say Western knowledge, I mean like their business sense and they're combining it with their cultural knowledge and they're driven. They have this dogged determination unrelenting um, pursuit to be excellent in all that they do and to mingle in the corporate world and to bring a greater understanding 
of our ancient ways and, and culture and to provide people the, to be a conduit to um, help people understand our ways and for them to appreciate it. And that's certainly one of our, um, our mottos is that, that we want people to leave a greater version of themselves because they've spent time with us on country. Yeah. And, um, and so with uh, those transformational moments that you were just asking there before, um, that's what we're finding. You know, families are bringing their kids up, mums and dads, and, um, and they're asking, you know, the kids are asking, when are we going back to see Johnny? <laughs> and so that's like one of the greatest, the greatest um, honours. And, um, yeah. and, that is so uh, good to hear. Yeah, and so... So, so good um, to hear. So, so yeah, so the so we're, they're driven. Um, uh, the I think the ancestors are driving them. Uh, the development of their capacity and their capabilities are right across many many sectors in tourism and hospitality, innovation and technology. They're they're, they're changing the industry. They're game changers. Yep. And um, yep. with the seasons changing and climate changing, mate, we've been we've been dealing and adapting to this and being resilient to this for thousands of years. So this is no newy for us. This is. This is how we roll. This is how we go. So we yep. observe all around us how things are, and uh, and it's also a circular economy. We we look after each other. That's that's how we are. We're supporting all the um, indigenous businesses around the area. We all look after each other. When when we can't take a tour, we're passing on to another one. Um, I don't do day tours anymore, but uh, there are others that do. And so with the the learning of language, elders are reconnecting. Um, uh, Non-Indigenous kids are going home learning Kuka Yalanji as well by Juan Walker. So, you know, there's a diversification of income uh, from uh, uh, doing things all through with culture and tradition and culture and language. So all these things are being restored. And uh, so I, we, I couldn't be uh, more prouder than all my colleagues and all my other Indigenous uh, business owners and operators. And uh, especially after we've all been locked up for so long now, People are just wanting to touch it, feel it, experience it, and throw themselves in and say, yep. we can't wait for yep. the borders to open. Yeah, we're, we're, we're yep. ready, we're poised. But we're in one of the greatest positions now, ready to go. And so here we are. Yep. Yep. You are uh, the forefront of certainly ecotourism. Let's bring in uh, Quentin Long from Australian Traveller. After, after Quentin, I'll start putting some of your questions uh, to the panel. So uh, if you've got a question... Put them in the chat box. They'll come through to me and, uh, and we'll start the discussion after catching up with Quentin. Quentin, listening to all the discussion on, on about purposeful travel, how does this translate to the mainstream consumer? We've sort of, is it right to say in the past it's been um, the domain of, of the high-end consumer? Is it, is it now broader now? Yeah, great, Koshi, and great to be with you. And, and I'd like to also, you know, I'm on Gadigal land and also pay my respects to elders past, present and, and emerging as, as John did and yourself. Um, absolutely, Koshi, this is this is now a mainstream media, it, or sorry, a mainstream movement for want of a better term. You know, if you think about travel um, and, and something that we're really conscious of at Australian Traveller Media is that Travel is a privilege. It's also an expression of a life well lived, particularly in wealthy third, um, first world countries. You know, like travel is so important to us. And, and, and we think about it often about, if I think about my family, the most important moments are when we're traveling, when we really connect to each other and we connect to each, uh, you know, to others. And, we, and, and that idea that, that John was talking about, which is we seek out difference, we seek out authenticity, really has sort of evolved now where no matter what you do in travel, there is a great element and a great concern for what is it doing for me and what are my actions, what are they having on the people that I'm interacting with on the landscapes, the communities, the people. Because, you know, we really do now feel that it's important that we make informed choices. And so everyone is seeking out the information to make sure that their choices they understand the ramifications. They understand the good or not so good that they may or may not be participating in. And I think this is fantastic because what it does mean is places like tropical North Queensland and, and Mark so eloquently sort of expresses, which is we can't do this by ourselves. One of the greatest quotes I ever got about the Great Barrier Reef was mother nature can't heal the Great Barrier Reef. She needs human intervention. 
And that is such a great moment for travellers to be able to participate in that really amazing work. And I think that as custodians like Mark is of, of Tropical North Queensland, it's fantastic. But even people like Johnny, who's a custodian of this fantastic, living, ancient culture, we get to participate is a privilege. We get to participate and also add and also see it sustain. That is such a transformative moment. And so no matter what travel you're looking for, because you, the only other thing I think is really interesting, Koshi, about travel is that we don't always seek out the same thing from every bit of travel. Sometimes I just want to go and relax and rejuvenate. Sometimes I want to be invigorated and challenged and learn. And sometimes I want to just you know, be with my community and my people or my family. And every single one of those journeys can contribute, as, as we've expressed today, to the, the greater cause. And I think that connection is what is absolutely mainstream now. Travellers, people, more than ever, need, want, and absolutely prioritise and value connection. Connection to community, connection to people, connection to land, connection to landscape. And that's what travel does best. It's an educational tool, absolutely always has been. But now it's an incredible force for transformation of the world that we live in, both environmentally, communities, all that sort of stuff. And, and I, I think the digitisation of the world, uh, the pace of work, the 24-7 connection makes it even more powerful, does it? Sort of uh, travel can connect us back to who we are as a person. The busier we are, the more reconnection we need. Yeah, absolutely. So there's this weird, weird trade-off where you expend so much energy in your day-to-day -day that you deplete yourself and travel actually rejuvenates that and, and, you know, and gives you the, the sort of momentum forward. And I think what's really important to remember here is that while we think about travel as a privilege, the role of digitization and, and what's really most important to the consumer is trust. They want to be able to trust that they are actually doing the right thing. And if we can make it easy for them to understand that, and that's what I see our role is, which is giving them the ability to feel good about their decisions, trusting that their decisions are good and knowing that they're making a positive difference because that's what they seek. Um, and so that's that's where, where it's really important that media is, is and, and you, as you know yourself, Koshi, being in the media, we've got to meet people where they are Yep. We've got to yep. enable them to make great decisions. We don't want to shame them. And then we also want to lead them and give them more things to think about and see how they can actually progress this even more. Yep, absolutely. Um, really, really great discussion. Let's start getting into uh, some of your questions. And thank you, everyone, for sending them through. Some have been sent through uh, before the session started. And we've got a few coming in uh, during the session. Um, Catherine um, poses a question. Does the panel uh, think that the Australian travellers' pursuit of greater purpose in their travel plans post-COVID might result in a marked increase in domestic exploration and spend? Uh, Lee, uh, what's your view on that? You're there, uh, you may have uh, just unmute Lee. Sorry, <laughs> you got That's me out. Right. Not a problem. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, look, I think we've begun to appreciate where we are a lot, a lot more. Um, when you talk to people about that, what they want to do right now, they don't want to go to Bali. They want to explore our own country. And I think what happened is that we, that's what, when the pandemic began, that's what we all said, great. You know, this is a fantastic opportunity to explore Australia and, and you know, find out about our, our own country. But, of course, the border closures have meant that we haven't been able to do that. So I think there's even more anxiousness to, to get out there. And, I mean, I'm looking at these beautiful backdrops um, and thinking, oh, I really wish I was there. And I, so I think that, yes, I, I think that, that there will be a greater interest in Australia 
and I think there already has been. But I also think everything that the panel has just said um, so eloquently is what's marvellous about Australia and what we, we have and what we don't want to lose. And I think there is also an awareness of that. And I think people really do want to go and be enriched, but also give back in those communities so that we see ourselves much more as, as part of an ecosystem rather than just a traveler going somewhere. So, so yes, I think yeah. that there's definitely more, more um, there's going to be more passionate <laughs> Australian yeah. travelers going to Australia. Um, Actually, I don't know Yes, Sorry, can I just jump in on that? Like, I just wanted to echo that, but also that I think that the, gen the transformation that Australia has been through in the last 20 years is phenomenal. And that, you know, starting 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I sold my house and started a business on the idea of selling Australia to Australians so that they'd appreciate that this is not just a country, it's an entire continent mm -hmm. full of incredible diverse experiences. And, you know, we're working on some major projects now that look at how far we've come you know, in the last five years, our celebration of our Indigenous brothers and sisters' culture and our observation and respect and our earnest pursuit of understanding that has been astronomical, you know, and, and let alone the way we've actually understood and appreciated what the environment is to Australia. And I think that you'll see that that continues on and be much more purposefully driven and much more um, succinctly pursued as a purposeful reason. It's not just I'm gonna to go to tropical North Queensland and I'm gonna lie on Seven Mile Beach and have a fabulous time. I'm gonna to go to Seven Mile Beach, I'm gonna lie on the beach for half a day, but God, I can't wait to go and see Johnny. I can't wait to go and see the Cookie Lange guys and the Walker Brothers and all that sort of stuff. That becomes infused in what our natural expectation of a holiday is. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Jan has sent in a question. How are we going to make travel fun once again without too many restrictions? Um, John O'Sullivan, um, this is you, you're probably at the forefront of this with all your different experiences and uh, all of the individual restrictions on them as well. Oh, look, I think I mean it's it's a great question, and I know where we're standing right now. But you know, PCR tests. I mean, God knows I've had fifteen of them. You've got rapid antigen tests. You've got all these different restrictions. But you know what? Consumers have been so boxed in and pent up for the last you know two years let's you know let's face it, we had bushfires which disrupted the industry and then we rolled into you know just when we thought we were through what was you know a pretty devastating event for the country we rolled into you know we rolled into COVID and people want to get out there is this basic desire that they want to experience things so you know what we're seeing is we're seeing that you know People want to throw themselves out of an aircraft, you know, over the Great Barrier Reef from up to 15,000 feet. Or they want to go and walk on Mariah Island or go to Bamaroo Plains and experience, you know, wild bush luxury. So people, you know, want to get out there. And I think it reinforces what Lee and Quentin just said in answer to the first question that, you know, there's this, there, there is this real change happening in our industry now. In many ways, as disruptive as COVID has been, it's probably gone a long way to addressing, you know, one of the big issues that our industries face, which is outbound replacement, you know, that leakage of Australians overseas. Because I think, you know, destinations like Bali, um, you know, some of these destinations that have traditionally taken a lot of share out of the Australian domestic industry of Australians, uh, I think they're going to take, it's going to be harder for them to come back. So I think, yeah, it sounds daunting. It is daunting when, you know, you're getting your swabs and all that sort of stuff, but People are going to see through that, and I think they're just going to embrace the opportunity to do experiences. Um, Mark Olson, uh, the co tourist community up in tropical North Queensland, how are they coping with that? Are they finding that that is a big element of, of their pitch to consumers now is to say, hey, yes, you've, you know, it's been uh, emotionally taxing with different border changes and the like, hey, it's all being streamlined for you. We're going to help you get here in the easiest possible way and enjoy yourself. Yeah, absolutely, Kosh. You've got more than 2,500 different experiences in the region. And every one of those staff just love showing off this place to people. So we've always been innovators. So if you walk into the Reef Fleet Terminal today to, uh, to make your booking to go out on the Great Barrier Reef, one of those staff, probably one of John's staff, is going to walk up to you in the queue 
have a chat to you, make sure that you're okay, ask you a question, have you got this sorted, have you got that sorted, what can we do to make it easy for you? We've always loved doing that for our visitors here and, and everyone gets that warm welcome and we hear that consistently over the last 20 months. People say we love coming to Cairns and the Great Barrier Reef because you're always so friendly, you're always warmly welcome and the industry really embraces that idea of this is supposed to be fun. We love making sure that we look after the environment. We love working with businesses like Johnny who are conserving culture, but we want to make sure that you're having a good time in doing it. So if you're playing by the pool at a luxury resort and you realize that the straw you're drinking out of is paper and not plastic, um, you might realize that beneath the water, we're working really hard to make sure that your holiday is fun and environmentally sensitive. And you know that the guide who's taking you out is gonna make sure you have a really great time because when you are having a great time, you remember so much more and you take away so much of the experience with you. Yep. Um, question here from Tessa. What's the essential ingredient to fostering a connection with nature through our tourism products? Johnny, this is, this is your wheelhouse. What, what do you see as the essential ingredients to fostering that kind of connection with nature in your business? Johnny, am I, are, you, are you on mute? Maybe if you, you get uh, on right. mute there. Yeah, there you go, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, for us, um, it's uh, walking out with a traditional owner. Um, I mean, especially where I go, um, wear your passport uh, to that area. Um, there are sites that are accessible um, through other groups and other operators, but especially with me, um, no one can access that area ex except through traditional owners. So wear your passport and um, it's so remote, you don't know where to go. But um, yeah, with us, mate, that's, that's um, how you can get out there. And so come see through country through our eyes. And um, so the key thing for us is just walking with traditional owners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is, it is, is it providing an experience that just no one else can provide. Uh, that it's all, it's basically a privilege, uh, a privilege to be involved in in your tours and what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So we're we're in a position where it's quite unique that no one in the region is doing what uh, Jaramali is doing. And, um, and we support all our other operators that's in the region, but no one is doing what we're doing. So um, to really get on country and experience it for a couple of nights and a few days uh, is really something else. And so we're, we're proud of what we got. And um, yeah, we'd, we'd love to take um, people out there and uh, we love showing it off. And um, yeah, when, and we love just showing people our country and we, you know, they're just, they're walking with us. It's, uh, it's just what we do. So they're just joining us, you know? Yep, yep, yep absolutely. Um, another question, um, this one to you, Mark. Uh, what are the logistics involved in becoming fully operational again in the COVID climate? And are there jobs waiting to be filled by young people interested in tourism and uh, eco-tourism? And I, I, I can just sense the answer uh, coming from you is too right, we've got plenty of jobs. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got so many jobs going at the moment, Koshi. Um, you know, particularly for Australians, we would love to see Australian uh, young people in particular choose the tourism industry. You know, I'm lucky enough to have worked in the tourism industry for 25 years. I started when I was in high school. Um, it's seen me through an incredible career so far, and I'm only just getting started. Um, we'd love to see more young Aussies take up the opportunity that so many of our international travellers have taken up. They become tour guides, they get out on country. But as you said, right throughout tourism um, with the response of the COVID pandemic, we've got more work to do in guiding customers and helping to understand the requirements, uh, making sure they're safe, doing the security stuff, doing the, uh, the COVID stuff. So there's always gonna be a great job in tourism and remembering that you've got that kind of higher purpose, that greater purpose, of helping people to see great and feel great and leave greater. So there's always that reward at the end um, of a hard day's work of knowing like Johnny has done and John and his team have done for so many years is to, to watch those visitors walk away and know that you've made a real difference in their lives and probably the way that they're gonna approach the rest of their lives um, around the environment and culture and community. Yep. Um, Quentin, we've got a question that's been sent in 
Um, how does purpose of travel affect people's accommodation choices? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Koshi. And, and the first thing I'd say is that I think the consumers move so far that to some extent, they're really expecting certain things to be understood. You know, single use plastics, they're no longer like, oh, do you use them? It's like, oh my God, if you're, if you're still using them, then I'm obviously in the wrong place. Like as if you would still be using single use plastics. That's where the consumer is. And I think most of the industry is. But what it's also doing is making sure that people seek out, as Lee said at the very beginning, is the questions they're asking are completely different to the questions they used to ask. The questions they're now asking is, what is the overall impact that this uh, accommodation provider has? What are they doing about the environment? Where are they and how are they actually adding to the regeneration? It's not, you know, we've moved so far from the idea of leaving only footsteps, which is what, what we used to say about sustainable tourism, we'll only leave footsteps. No, no, no. Now we're looking at how can I leave this environment better than when I found it? And so that's what they're looking for when they look at their accommodation providers or any tourism provider at all. And I think that really the other thing that I thought was really interesting about today's discussion was let's not forget about fun. It's absolutely so much fun. Just look at Johnny, you know, and imagine being out on his country with him. He's a fun, happy, laughing kind of guy. What a privilege it would be to hang out with him. And I think he actually underestimates or sort of underplays. They talk about, you know, Johnny's talking about being a passport to an environment. I think he's more likely a counsellor for most people between them, nature and culture. And, and really, yeah. it's such an important part of what we do. Yep. Um, Lee, we've got uh, another question here, um, which is before the pandemic, some places were overrun with tourists. How will providers balance the need to accommodate tourists without returning to over-tourism, but still keep travel affordable? It's a, um, it's a delicate balance, is it? Yeah, so the question of, of, of cost, money, often comes up with this, and really we have to make people think about value rather than, than what things cost. But I think, um, you know, Hawaii is an interesting case in point because they, of course, during the pandemic had so little tourism, a lot of the community was dependent on tourist dollars, but actually now they're going, hey, well, you know, we don't have 15,000 cars a day. We don't have tourists coming in and not respecting our culture, which is which is actually the number one problem that they that they they enunciated. So, you know, is there a way of actually um, handling this so that communities are really consulted about? their destinations. And this is where the enlightened destinations are really incredibly important. I think it's a kind of an ecosystem that we're in from tourists um, to travel advisors, to companies, to hotels. It's all should be working together. And I think the most important thing is the consult consulting local communities so that the profits that a few make are not affecting the wellness of the whole community. So I hope that answers the questions really people do have to look at this. And I think in terms of, of, uh, of a tourist going somewhere, some of the best experiences we have, we're talking about fun, are the exchange with, with other people who are different and the sort of knowledge. So the dollar value of that is, is something that you, you really can't, you know, you can't put a dollar value on it. So this is where the cost of something as opposed to the value of something is, is terribly important. And if you go somewhere and you know the communities are happy and are being consulted, then you have a better experience as well. Yep. Um, Mark Olson, this, this question has been sent in. What are the emerging trends in sustainable tourism that can be explored in key popular locations like, like the... Great Barrier Reef. Are you are you seeing any any emerging trends that are just starting to appear that could, that could be others could capitalise on? Yeah, there's two that immediately jumped to mind, Koshi. Um, during the COVID times, the federal government supported the reef industry to continue the coral planting, and uh, they put visitors on their boats when they were going out to do some of this. And some of the most amazing and transformational moments for visitors happened when they were watching the divers go down and do some of the coral planting. So now you've got people buying in and they're actually choosing the tour that does the coral planting on the way home um, or on the way out. 
as the primary product. To, to Lee's point exactly, um, it costs more to spend a little longer on the reef, but the transformational moment that comes from knowing that you're getting out and making a difference um, is one that's really incredible. I think the connection to culture, and, and Quentin touched on it before, you know, we've seen transformational change in generations and uh, and families today are looking to make that connection uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and tourism provides that gateway, they provide that passport or that permission really to have the conversation and whether it is talking to one of John's crew on the boat without being involved in a cultural experience or getting out on a cultural tour with someone like Johnny or Juan uh, or the guys from Manangalba Yadinji. Um, more and more Aussies have been asking, how can we have a go at getting engaged with uh, First Nations people? What are some of the first steps that we can take? You know, the Laura Dance Festival was booked out, then it was locked out, and then it was completely resold by a whole new group of customers who jumped in to have the opportunity to connect with Aboriginal culture in the most incredible way. And I was lucky enough to be there uh, to see some of the performers from right across the Cape and the Gulf um, showing their connection to country over thousands of years through song and dance. So I think two of those really jump out at me. And there's really been a clear demonstrable change in the way consumers buy uh, through COVID. Yeah, it's a, quite interesting, isn't it? Because consumers want the experience, but but they want to do it respectfully. Um, they want to do it right and to almost have that support around them, Mark, don't they? That's right. And tourism's always provided that great. permissive connection. You yep, know, you've had that absolutely. ability to, to book it, to know that you're doing it in the right way. And, and I'll, I'll tell a little story about John's product because it's one of my favourite uh, ways to take our friends out to enjoy the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it doesn't promote itself as a cultural experience, but it is by First Nations people. And each and every one of them has their own personal story and connection. What I love about taking people out are those little moments where you you grab your lunch and you're sitting down and, and one of the crew who's from Yarrabah or from that sea country comes and sits next to you, have a bit of a chat and ask you about your day. And you get these little moments um, where you spark off and you have a chat to each other. Yes, there is a, a cultural performance associated with the day, but it's really just the opener for the conversations. And what we find most people are having the conversation about is where are you from? Where did you grow up? What's your story? What's your connection to tourism? Yeah. How did you get into it? Um, and when you get a chance to chat to like a, the first master reef guide um, from Yarrabah is a guy called Dustin. And uh, when you get a chance to chat to Dustin and spend some time with him, uh, it makes a hair stand up if you're on. It's just one of the most amazing little journeys. And you can do that on SkyRail. You can do that on so many experiences. You get to connect with people whose families have thousands of years of connection or thousands of generations. But you're doing that in a really simple and easy way. That's what's amazing, I think, about this part of the world. that It's going to keep me here for a very long time. Um, John O'Sullivan, a, uh, another question has come in. In your view, what are the top three decision drivers in choosing the location for travel? Well, I think it's I think it's a really interesting, really interesting question. But I think you know, coming back to you know, coming back to what we've been talking about before, um, I think you know, firstly, safety and security is always been that really that really functional that functional piece. The second one is you know the ease to which to get to the destination uh, is a is a key driver. And then you know, as we've been talking about now, this whole notion of you know travel for purpose and does the destination fulfil me in that way? Does it give me an opportunity to give back? Um, you know, is it going to transform you know transform my life if I if I do go there? So. You know, it's those sort of three things. And then you get the experience sets which plug into that. So, you know, things like food and wine, um, the, the ability to understand the, the cultural or the Indigenous story in and around the destination as well. So it's, a, you know, I guess it's a bit of a grab bag of, of drivers, but, you know, generally it's those top three and then supplemented by those other two that I just spoke about. Good advice indeed. As has been for the last hour, unfortunately, we've uh, we've run out of time at the moment. So, uh, um, a very big thanks to um, our guests, our panelists today, Johnny from way up in uh, Cooktown, to uh, to Mark Olson as well, to John O'Sullivan, Lee Lee Tullock, and Quentin Long. Um, very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today, and for everybody who's watching. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today. Um, I hope it helps you in your decision making as we rebuild from the pan pandemic and 
get back to a, uh, some sort of business as usual um, over the next 12 months or so. Now, if you want any more information, uh, a QR code is about to come up on the slide. If you want any more resources on ecotourism, sustainable tourism, um, that will get you through to a whole resource site of, of information that will really help you in your decision making uh, going forward. So just go on the QR code. You know, a few years ago, I always used to think QR codes, what a stupid technology that is. No one uses them. Now it runs our life, doesn't it? So it's about to come out. Just um, um, get it on your, on, your, uh, on your phone there and it will take you right through to um, uh, Tourism Tropical North Queens, uh, Tropical North Queensland's uh, resource centre that will answer all of your queries going forward. So thank you for joining us. Um, really good luck into the future in rebuilding your business um, and consumers really take advantage of the opportunities available. Thank you for having me and see you next time. When was the last time you discovered a place that is truly great? The kind of place that no matter where you go, you breathe in its grandeur. You feel its history. You hear its stories. And you can't help but immerse yourself in its absolute, undeniable, well, greatness. Here in Cairns and Great Barrier Reef, you not only find all this, you might even find yourself. You truly feel changed by this place. It's in all your senses, the tastes, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and just the overall feeling like nowhere else on earth. It's somewhere that will stay with you for life. Because here in Cairns and Great Barrier Reef, you'll see great and leave greater.